certain level of knowledge of what it is they're supposed to be doing. <coughs> and so we just need to do what we know we're supposed to be doing. <coughs> but while we strive to do that, there are a couple of things we have to bear in mind. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not demanded from us that we do so much that our time is very tight. What Allah has asked us to do is not so demanding of our time that we have time to do nothing else or that we're barely able to do these things. In our everyday life, very often at work, we run into situations where you kind of run out of time for certain, for certain projects. And so as a result, you work many hours, you work overtime, you even take work home just to get it uh, done on time, <coughs> within the deadline. And so people are stressed out as a result of this, always having to be worried about deadlines and always working hard just to make sure you make the deadline. When it comes to what we're required to do in order to get to paradise, it is very different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not burdened us with so many things that we're required to do that we barely, barely have enough time to do this. Alhamdulillah, he's given us a lifespan and that lifespan is more than adequate and enough for a person to comfortably do what he or she is supposed to do in order to go to paradise. In fact, brothers and sisters, the person who dies at the age of 40 and the person who dies at the age of 80, they are the same in terms of their ability to go to paradise. The one who lives the longer life does not have any better chance of going to paradise than the one whose life was shorter. So the length of the lifespan, whether it's long or short, does not take away from the ability of the individual, mashaAllah, to do what he or she is required to do to go to paradise. So we need to understand that the life we have, mashaAllah, is adequate enough. The question is, are we utilizing our time constructively and beneficially, or are we wasting it? <clears throat> the other thing to also bear in mind, brothers and sisters, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in as much as we are required to do things, at the same time, we're also required to maintain a balance. And what this means is that we should never overburden ourselves with things. We should never, you know, go to extremes, as we say. Because overburdening ourselves, what it leads to is burnout. And as Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentions in his explanation of a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he says, SubhanAllah, some people go to one extreme in taking on too much. They have all these good things they want to do. But after a while, they are burned out. They have no more energy. They cannot keep it up. So they go to one extreme, and they may be able to stay there for a while, Eventually, they can't keep it up, so what happens is they end up at the other extreme. So they stop doing anything, subhanAllah. See, from doing too much to doing nothing. What Allah wants is somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Not to be overly relaxed, per se, or liberal, or lenient, lazy, carefree. But at the same time, Allah does not want us to go to the other extreme either, where... You know, we, we burden ourselves and we become stressed out and burned out. So we have to maintain the balance. And this was an interesting comment that Ibn Hajar made. That the person who burns out, inevitably, would end up going to the other extreme now and not doing nearly enough that the person is, is supposed to be doing. And so the key is for us to maintain a balance in our lives. There are certain established principles, of course, that we have to upkeep. I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, the middle way for a person is praying three times a day. There are certain established principles we cannot cross. But praying five times a day, in as much as some people may see that as burdensome, in reality, it's not. It is not burdensome. 
It is just the perspective that the person is coming from. So these established principles and ibadat, we don't cross. But besides that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not demanded that we overburden ourselves with ibadat or anything like that. And this is why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, once when he came home, with Aisha radiallahu anha, there was a lady. And when he entered, the Prophet alayhi salam acknowledged this lady and he asked, who is this lady? And Aisha told him, this is so and so. And then she said that she mentioned to the Prophet alayhi salam the many prayers that this lady performed. Prayers here, of course, many prayers meaning nawafil, not the fard. Because we can't increase the fard from four rakats to, to five or anything more. It stays whatever it is, two or three or four. But she used to play a, a pray a lot of nawafil prayers. And so Aisha mentioned this. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hold on, hold it there. You would think that a person who is praying a lot, that the Prophet might have approved of that. You know, at least the person is praying. Rather than, you know, doing something perhaps that might be useless or non-beneficial, right? So it might seem to be a good thing. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't see it that way at all. In fact, he didn't even stay silent. He, he showed his disapproval in words. He said to Aisha, hold on there. What is the matter with one of you that you take on deeds you don't have the capacity to perform? Meaning, uh, on an ongoing basis. Right? We might be able to do it for a short time. But on a, on a long-term basis, we won't be able to do that. He said, what's the matter with one of you that you take on deeds that you don't have the capacity to do? For surely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not get tired of giving rewards, but the people get tired of doing the deeds. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, He never ever gets tired or bored of giving rewards. It is you and I who get tired, and what happens is we stop doing it, and once we stop doing it, there is no reward for it anymore. So it is not Allah who stops giving us the reward, it is we who stop doing the deed, and as a result, we cannot expect any reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the goal, as we strive as Muslims to do what we're supposed to do, it doesn't mean that we overburden ourselves, no. It means that we be regular in whatever, mashallah, we're doing. Be constant. Because Allah will never get tired of giving us rewards. The third thing we need to bear in mind as well is that striving for excellence is not considered extremism or is not considered going too far. Sometimes people ask, well, you know, if we're to maintain the balance, then what about striving for excellence? Striving for excellence is required. We are all encouraged to strive for excellence in whatever we do. The thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, has informed us it's not the quantity that he's looking for from us, but the quality. And the quality comes out in striving for excellence. So whatever we do, do it well. Do it well. Do it properly. Understand what we're doing. We should know what we're doing. And we should want to do that. We should not just do it mechanically. We should not just do it automatically. We should be conscious of why we're doing it. And that's why every time we pray, and we do that five times a day, we should take some moment to reflect on why is it I'm praying. So that the salah does not become an automatic or, automa or a mechanical action but that we're conscious for every prayer while we're doing it. This is the niyyah. This is what sincerity is all about. So striving for excellence is highly recommended. But at the same time, striving for excellence, as the Prophet ﷺ taught us, does not lead to extremism or rigidity or imbalance. The Prophet ﷺ strove for excellence and the Sahaba. But... This did not lead them to, to, to go to extremes in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet still maintained the balance. 
when he heard Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, a young man, strong man, he heard he was fasting every single day. So he called him. He said to, to Abdullah ibn Amr, I hear that you fast every single day. And this companion, radiallahu anhu, said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah, I am strong, I'm healthy. Masha Allah, it's very easy for me. Fasting every day. Now think about it, brothers and sisters, a young man fasting every day. That's a wonderful thing. Because if he doesn't fast, what would he do? In our society today, there are numerous uh, distractions. So fasting every day might be seen as a good thing because it keeps you away from evil. But the Prophet ﷺ did not see it that way. He told Abdullah ibn Amr, he said, I recommend that you fast three days a month. The 13th, 14th, and, and the 15th of the, the Islamic month. In the middle of the month there. Three days a month only. And Abdullah radiallahu anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, I, am, I have strength, I can do more. Give me more. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, In that case, fast every Mondays and Thursdays. So you're going to be fasting now eight times a month. Twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, times the four weeks every month, roughly about eight days a month, from three to eight. And Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, I have strength, I can do more, give me more. And the Prophet said to him, In that case, then you should fast the fast of Dawood alayhi salam. And there is no better fast than this. There is no fasting better than the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. And the Prophet ﷺ told Abdullah that Prophet Dawood ﷺ used to fast on alternate days. So he would fast today, let's say. He would skip tomorrow, fast next day, skip Thursday, fast Friday, and like that. Skip Saturday, fast Sunday, skip Monday, and you keep going down every other day. The Prophet says there is no other fasting better than this. And so Abdullah ibn Amr accepted that from the Prophet ﷺ, and he started to fast every other day. Later on in life, when he got older and he lived uh, a long life, he said, and he is the one who narrated this hadith in the Sahih, he said, I wish I had taken the ease that the Messenger of Allah had offered me so many years ago. When he was young and strong, see, he didn't look forward. He was thinking of today. I'm young and strong, I can do it. He said, I wished I had taken the ease that the Prophet ﷺ had offered to me so, so many years ago. Now I have gotten old. Fasting every other day has become difficult for me. However, I do not want to give up something, a pledge that I had with the Messenger of Allah. So he continued to fast, although he found it difficult because of that pledge, that deal sort of he made with the Prophet ﷺ so many years ago. Again, this incident, brothers and sisters, highlights for us that the ibadah is good, mashallah, but even in ibadah there is value. And that is what Allah wants from us only, nothing more. Nothing more. And that's why Allah tells us in the Quran, Fear Allah and keep your duty to Him to the best of your ability. The individual's ability, not even to somebody else's ability. Because again, right, all of us have different abilities. Allah says, no, you the individual, you fear Allah, and you keep your duty to him to the best of your ability. That is all, brothers and sisters, that Allah the Exalted has demanded from us. So as we strive to do what we know we should be doing, let us bear these points in mind so that we do not, do not deviate from the way and the manner in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to perform these things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed for mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us all to be among those who worship Him constantly with balance uh, according to the tradition and the sunnah of His noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May He accept from us our good deeds and forgive for us our mistakes. And may He keep us from the straight path أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته